So I grew up 30 miles from the University of Oklahoma, <laughs> Boomer Sooner, but then I attended the University of Oklahoma State, go Cowboys. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's a big part about why I'm, I'm here today. Um, had a great family, wonderful family, raised me in the church, heard the stories of the Bible, heard about Jesus, um, but what really wasn't until the end of high school where any of that really mattered to me. Um, started making decisions, maybe less than honorable decisions. And, and the way it, it happens further south is church is much more of a social endeavor than maybe other places. Um, but I recognize a lot of my friends that didn't go to church, didn't care about Jesus, were having way more fun. And that just looked more appealing. So, if, so for me, I learned how to live a double life. So I could be around church, good church people and live by one set of standards, and then I could go and have fun with my other friends and live by a totally different set of standards until that came to a head about my junior year of high school, and I just didn't know what to do. And that's where Jesus became not just truthful, and the Bible is truthful, but it became real. Um, I really had to get my life straightened, straightened out, uh, and God met me in a moment and convicted me and I'm sure some sermon way back there was in the back of my head, but I didn't know where it came from. But I just had this very clear recollection of a passage that comes from Isaiah, where it says, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. And in that, in that instant, God pinned me down and I said, that's exactly who I am, and I don't want to be that way anymore. So that's where God met me in that moment, finished high school, knew I should be different, didn't know how to be different. So it always felt like one step forward, two steps back. Um, so I finished high school, and uh, my parents said, so what do you want to do? What's your plan? And I said, you know, I've lived here my whole life. I'd like to go see some things. I've been looking into the train routes around town. I think I've figured out how to kind of be a hobo. I could jump the train and get to California, work my way up the coast, see the world. And my dad said, that is the dumbest thing you have ever said. <laughs> and we're not going to let you do that. Um, your mom has worked too hard to give you a chance to go to college. You're going to go to college. I said, okay, fine, I'll go to college. But I'm going to go to Chicago. So I started the application for the University of Chicago and then realized I am not smart enough to get into that school. So my other option was to go to Oklahoma State. Um, I had some academic scholarships there. Um, my brother went there. My mom went there. We had friends that were going there. Had little to no interest in college, but knew if I was going to go there, I had to declare something in the College of Agriculture to keep my scholarships. So I did agricultural communications. So that's, that's my background. I'm an ag communications major. I tell people I use about half of my degree, uh, just the communications part. I reserve the agriculture part for our garden at home. Um, but when I went to college, uh, earlier you mentioned discipleship. That's really where that came into my life for the first time in a really clear way. I um, went to college. There was a campus ministry there that was handing out free pizza. And as a 19-year-old young guy, I thought, free pizza, that sounds exactly like what I want to go and be a part of. So I met some people um, it, that were just different. The questions that they asked and the way that they conducted their lives and the things that mattered to them were different. And I didn't know what it was yet, but I thought, I think I'll stick around long enough and find out. So I started getting involved with that group of students, um, had some opportunities to learn, did Bible studies, that kind of thing. But the summer after my freshman year, they did a summer discipleship program in Denver. They said, come, live with us for two months. Everyone gets a job. We work in the day. Nights, we study the Bible. We go share the gospel with people. We serve in the church. And I said, well, if it's not Oklahoma. I've never been to Colorado, so I guess I'll, I'll try that out. So I went and spent two months there. And while we were there, um, we partnered with a church. And the church I grew up in, praise God for Brother Joe Elam, preached uh, verse by verse every morning, and then every Sunday night preached topical sermons my entire life. I don't know that I paid attention to a single sermon that he did. But praise God for him, because he's kind of set the stage for this pastor in Colorado, because that was a point where I wanted to learn. I wanted to figure out what it looked like to walk with Jesus and to be faithful. And so we would go to this church every week, and when Mike would stand up and preach, it was the first time it made sense to me, probably because I wasn't listening before. 
Um, but every week it was it was just different. And then he would come over to where we we lived at a, some campus apartments nearby. And every Thursday night he would come over and talk about evangelism. He says, "This is this is the way I live my life, and this is the way I share and tell people about Jesus." And he probably only talked about four out of the eight weeks because the other half he would bring in people from his church that he had led to faith in Jesus. People, most of the people in their 30s and 40s and 50s before they started walking with Jesus. So it wasn't just talk for Mike. It was his, it was his walk. And that made a big difference. Um, I got back, finished the summer, went back to Oklahoma. Our campus director had taken a, a different job and position. And they said, well, we're going to have somebody here in a few months. He's from Colorado. Um, we think he'll be a good fit. So a few months after that, Mike's story went from pastoring a church in Colorado that he had founded and, uh, and pastored for nearly 30 years, and at 65, retired into college ministry um, because he thought that was the most strategic use of his life that God had for him in that moment. Um, and then he spent the next couple of years, my undergrad, the guy mentored and discipled me. Uh, I had the chance to step on staff there when I graduated for several years. Um, my wife was doing the same thing in Colorado. We got married. We worked together in Oklahoma before God brought us to South Dakota. And so now we've been here seven years trying to do that same thing, meet young men and women, college age, 18 to 24. Um, some have grown up in the church. Most of them haven't. But really, they're in this crucial time frame of figuring out, like, what am I going to do? Who am I going to be? And how am I going to live my life? And so we really, we really value and, and that strategy and, and we're grateful that God allows us to minister in that context um, because oftentimes it's one of the most available seasons of their life at least they don't understand that and so we try to tell them over and over and over that this is the most discretionary time that you will ever have because when you leave and you have a boss and a job and a family and children that starts to shrink drastically and so we really challenge them to invest that time in college to learn what it means to know God deeply and to walk with him faithfully so they will do that for the rest of the life rest of their life and be in a position to help other people do that well. So that's that's a little bit about me, but really what I wanted to share with you guys this morning, as I understand last week Bruce started taking you guys through First Timothy. And um, and because discipleship is one of the things I, I love to talk about, I thought it would be fun to do an overview of the person of Timothy and how God used Paul in his life to disciple and train him up so that in this letter that you're going to go through as a, as a young pastor, a young leader in that church in Ephesus, how had God shaped him and prepared him? And then what, how did that influence the things that Paul is encouraging him with and then how he led that church in Ephesus? So we're, it won't necessarily be a, a verse by verse. You might have to flip around a little bit, and I'm going to do a lot of overview. Um, but really, that's what I wanted to share with you today. So before we get to that, let me, and this is something, I work with college students, so we do a lot of discussion intermingled into any teaching or sermon. So let me ask you to do this. Turn to the person next to you, and if you're not next to somebody, turn to the person behind you. And I want you to try to answer these two questions. What is a disciple, and what is discipleship? And I'll, I'll give you about three or four minutes, so it's okay to talk. Uh, go ahead and try to come up with a good answer for these two questions, and then we'll get into the life of Timothy. All right. Uh, would anyone care to share? What, what's a disciple? Give me a good working definition. I see some elbow nudging. <laughs> What do you got? I say a disciple is like a follower of God, and then discipleship is like teaching of the Word. Okay, good. Anyone want to add add to that? Other other things? Over here. A follower of, of any teacher. Mm-hmm. Because they're not all all disciples aren't disciples of Christ. I mean, they all work. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. And discipleship is learning it and doing it. Following that man, learning something, and then teaching people. 
Good. Good. See, so you guys are way ahead of me. That's like slide number four, and that's we're just on slide number one. <laughs> well, good. Um, I'll, I'll share with you my, my working definitions at the end, but I would say you guys are already very, very close to what I intend to show you. Um, but the reason why it matters is uh, I know you're going to go through 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy is, is probably a core verse to, to the ministry that we do with Campus Ventures. So 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is when Paul has written a letter back to Timothy, and he says, Now the things that you have learned and received and heard from me among many witnesses... Entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So we talk a lot about the fourth generation. You have Paul who encountered Christ, drastically changed his life, became an apostle uh, and a, an apostle to the Gentiles, taking the good news of Jesus to people that didn't think they had a chance to be a part of that family. At some point, Timothy comes along with him and does ministry with him and learns from him how to do that. And in the letter, he says, okay, now find some faithful people, generation number three, that you can start to give this away to, that you can teach and that you can train and that you can share and love and encourage, who will be able to teach others also. So Paul, Timothy, faithful people, others. So we talk about the fourth generation. So um, that's pretty core to who we are because... What we try to convey to students, and really this is for all of us to remember, that our walk with Jesus is deeply personal, but it's never intended to stay with just us. It's something that we do and that we learn to, to know and to love God deeply to the extent that we start to give that away freely. So we tell students that we want their time in college to be a time where they know God well, better than they've ever known God before. But if that were the final finish line, that we would fall short of what the scripture, the picture the scripture paints for us. That we want them to know God so well, they're starting to look for opportunities to love and to serve others, to tell them about Jesus. And if they come to faith, praise God, that now they get to invest in that person and start to establish them in their relationship with, with Christ so that they can give that away to someone else also. Um, so I know you'll get to Second Timothy eventually, but I think that's core to who we are. That's core to who it, what it means to walk with Jesus. And I would say that's core to Paul's letter to Timothy as a young leader in a church and what he's intending to do as he leads that church in Ephesus. So, um, so I want to give you a little overview of the person of Timothy and how, how did God disciple Timothy through Paul? So let's go to this. What do we know about Timothy? Some things we know from Scripture. He's from the city of Lystra, which is in modern-day Turkey. I know you guys have this map over here for praying for the persecuted church. So you can find Turkey pretty easy. Um, The first time Paul meets Timothy, it mentions um, that he comes from a family where his dad is Greek, but his mother is Jewish. Um... And he's already a disciple. He already has heard the good news of Jesus. And he knows the scriptures. I think it's in 2 Timothy where he says, Your mother Lois and your, sorry, Eunice, and your grandmother Lois shared the scriptures with you to help bring you to a point of salvation. So he grew up in a family where they knew the stories of God's faithfulness to Abraham, to Isaac, to the whole family in the nation of Israel, all the way up to the person of Jesus as the Messiah. And um, so he meets, he meets Timothy as he's going out on these missionary journeys. Um, and some, kind of looking at dates, some scholars will think that at this point in time, Paul was roughly in his late 40s, 48 to 50. And Timothy was still a young guy, early 30s, maybe late 20s, when they encountered each other. And then Paul chose Timothy, said, come with me. There's some work to do. There's people that haven't heard this, this good news about Jesus that need to hear it. How about you come with me? Um, and because he comes from a Greek household, but he's going to go to cities that have Jewish people and Greek and uh, Gentile people, he says, look, it's not going to be easy. There's already some conflict happening. Uh, Jewish people, they don't like what we're having to say about the inclusion of more people. So 
Um, and if you've read any of Paul's letters, you know that he doesn't really give a lot of value to the practice of circumcision. But Paul's a practical evangelist, so he says, but let's do that so that you can come with me and tell people about Jesus, and that's one less obstacle for us to have to navigate. So uh, we know Paul meets him. We know Paul uh, invites him to go on the journey with him. And we know that um, one of the reasons Paul chose him is because he already had a good reputation among the church there in Lystra. Um, that he was, a, he was a person who was walking his talk. So um, Paul invites him to go on these journeys. And it's, it's a long time. Let's, let's go to this next one. Anyone like maps? Or is that the least used part of your Bible? <laughs> I was a geography minor, so I love maps probably too much. So any excuse I have to put it in there, I do. Uh, but this is a map of Paul's missionary journeys. A little hard to see. But anyway, uh, the red dotted line is his first one. He starts with Antioch. He goes out, makes a loop. He meets Timothy on his second missionary journey, which is the purple one. Uh, so he goes up through Antioch to Tarsus, meets Timothy and Lystra and Derby. says, come with me. There's work to do. There's people that need to know. Let's do this together. So they go through the rest of uh, Asia and then uh, what we know as Greece, through here, and then back down to Jerusalem. Uh, and then there's a third missionary journey later that Timothy goes on with Paul. It's this green one. So they leave here. Um, no, that's in Mount. They start in Antioch, sorry. They go back to the cities where they had preached the gospel of Jesus to build up the church and make sure people are growing uh, and learning and putting into practice the things that they heard. So they go up, they go back through Ler Derby and Lystra and Iconium. Uh, they go across to Ephesus. Uh, this past semester, we just went through Ephesus with our college students and looked at uh, Paul's interactions there. Um, I always have to remember that Paul didn't do this solo. He did it with a team. So Paul and Timothy and several other people and when they get to Ephesus, which is where Timothy is as the pastor, as you go through 1 Timothy, they spend upwards of two to three years in that city. They spent three months going to the synagogues, starting with the Jewish people, saying, everything that we've waited for is here in the person of Jesus. And after three months, they said, we don't want to hear anymore. We're done. So Paul changes gears. They say, okay, let's go to the Gentiles. Let's tell them. And for the next two years, daily, they went to the lecture hall, just kind of the, the meeting place where people would stop and discuss and talk about things every day for two years. Mm. Um, in the middle of the day. Some translations say daily, some say midday. Basically, you don't have AC. So you get up, you work early in the morning when it's cool, you take a break, you go back, you finish in the evening. So midday is when people sat around and talked. That's when Paul and Timothy and all these other people sat and they said, we've got to find a way to convey this message. So Paul and Timothy have a deep relationship with the people that he eventually goes back to pastor. So they leave Ephesus, they go back up, they go around, uh, they come back down, and they don't go back to Ephesus. They stop in the city of Miletus, and... Uh, they ask the elders of that church to come and meet them because they already caused a ruckus. You can read Acts chapter 19. There's this big riot. Um, so Paul says, we're not going to go back in, but we do need to talk to the leaders of this church. And he tells them in my leaders, he says, I will never see you again. Because I don't know what's in store for me, but all I know is God tells me in front of me is suffering and hardship for the sake of Jesus and for you. And so I will never see you again. And in that, in that encounter in Acts 19, it says they weep with Paul. And then they pray for him and they send him. And Timothy is there watching this whole thing. So the end of this, Paul gets back to, uh, back to Jerusalem. And if you keep reading through Acts, you know that when he gets there, he has this encounter that basically starts him on a journey to Rome where he has to face uh, Roman judgment, and eventually leads to house arrest, and then, and then later he dies. Um, why, so why do I tell you this? Because I think this kind of sets the stage for what Timothy's discipleship was like. Timothy found a teacher in Paul. 
a person who is willing and able to say, come with me, and we need to put into practice the things that Jesus said. And there's people that need to hear the story of what he's accomplished. So let's do this together. And everywhere Paul went, Timothy went. And there were some times where Paul said, Timothy, you go over here and then come back. Um, but they worked together. And if you've ever traveled, uh, anyone ever been to this part of the world? I, I have not. These are not close cities together. You can't just like jump in the car and be there in 45 minutes. And they didn't have cars. Lots of road time. So these journeys that they had together took years. So it's not, it wasn't, Paul didn't come in and say, Timothy, I've got an eight-week discipleship program. Let me put you on the fast track. And then we'll get you back in there. No, they, he invited him into his life and said, there's a lot of work to do. Let's do it together. And if, if what I found is accurate, from where Paul meets Timothy and Lystra to when Paul uh, is executed, martyred, it's about 15 years. So it takes, a, it takes a long time. And some of that was in person. And then when he's under house arrest and you're going through person, he even wrote letters to encourage him from afar. But, uh, but that's, that's the experience that Timothy had that God used to shape him into a young leader who could rightly teach and discern the word, uh, who could walk his talk, who could know what it means to have compassion and suffer alongside people, to weep when God says, I'm going to separate you for, for the good of the kingdom. That's the kind of leader that Timothy was because of God's work in Paul's life and Paul's investment in Timothy and Timothy being willing to say, I'll go where you go. Show me what it looks like and let's do this together. Um, so why does this matter? Uh, well, it matters because it goes all the way back to what Jesus said after the resurrection. The last thing he charges the disciples with in Matthew 28, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them how to obey all the things I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you even to the end of the age. So Jesus gave that charge to the disciples. Jesus encounters Paul, and he's included in that charge. Paul is carrying out that mission, and he meets Timothy, a guy who has already come to faith but needs to walk that out for himself. He needs to gain those muscles and exercise that faith in a way that's going to serve and benefit others. And Timothy says, yes, I'll do that. Let's go. Where you go, I'll go. What you do, I'll do. Whatever it takes to glorify God and, and let people know. And God uses all of that to shape Timothy into the leader uh, that he is in Ephesus. And because of that, Timothy had a healthy perspective and proper expectations of what it took to lead a church, to make disciples, in, I, and I would say in a, in a very difficult climate. It wasn't like he had a ton of status or clout. Christianity was definitely was not like the popular religion of the day. Um, and if you look through church history and it talks about the rest of Timothy's life, um, it's, they say that he was roughly in Ephesus pastoring and leading about 15 to 20 years. And then the end of his life, he's actually martyred for his faith because, again, he's there in Ephesus. And one of the major religions, uh, there's tons of Greek gods and goddesses, and Ephesus is known for being like the center of worship to the Greek god of Artemis. And church history says that... Um, there was a day where they were parading through town, worshiping Artemis, and he was so overcome with frustration that people were blindly worshiping this, this false goddess that he goes out and he tries to convey to them why they're wrong and why they need to turn to Jesus, and the crowd turns on him and beats him to death. So he, he finished well. He didn't just hang it up and retire and say, okay, I'm done. His love and his devotion to Jesus carried him through the rest of his life. He invested that in the people of Ephesus, and he did everything he could to try to convey that message to the people there, even if it was not received. 
So his success was not because of tons and tons of people converting and following Jesus. His success was because of his faithfulness to Jesus and the message that he was carrying. Um, so th- that's one reason. So when he had proper expectation um, and perspective about what it looked like to be faithful to Jesus to the end, he knew what it meant to invest his life into other people because he had seen it firsthand with Paul. And he knew that discipleship and making disciples was not a singular endeavor. It was a team effort. Because again, it wasn't just Timothy and Paul. Um, If you read through Acts and even the letters, when Paul addresses the letters to different people, it was Paul. uh, For a season, it was Paul and Barnabas. It was Paul and Barnabas and Silas. It was Paul and Silas and Timothy. Uh, There's other people like Erastus or Sopater or... (laughs) And then we're getting the Greek names that I'm probably going to butcher, so I hope they forgive me. Uh, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius from Derby and Tychicus and Trophimus and all the misses and the mooses uh, from from throughout (laughs) Europe. But um, but Timothy's experience was ministry as a team, not just I'm the leader, you follow, and not just I'm going to do this if nobody else does. We're going to try to do this together, Um, which matters when you're leading a group of people to know that you can't do it on your own and that the goal is bigger than just me, even though I am deeply and personally committed to it, matters to make a good leader and a good pastor. So let me go to this. Um, I asked you these questions at the beginning. What is a disciple? And I think you guys are pretty much pretty much answered it. So a disciple is not inherently Christian. A disciple could be anybody. Um, the word, the, also, full disclosure, I have not gone through Greek, so I'm relying on people that have and this, the study resources that I use that they've invested years to understand it, so I'm thankful for their work. Uh, but the words that they use to, dis, to the word disciple, in the language that the New Testament that was written. There's two nuances to it. One could be somebody that's just here to learn information. Uh, we probably think of a student uh, in a classroom, you teach me math, I will learn how to math, and then I'll pass the test and you graduate me. But that, that's not the way it gets used in the New Testament. That a disciple is a student, a disciple is a learner, but it's not just about a transaction of information. It is learning what they're saying, but also the way that they live and conduct their life. To become attached, not just to the information that person is teaching, but to attach themselves to that person. That's that's what Jesus did. When he called the disciples and said, follow me, they weren't just signing up for a Bible class or a Bible course to gain new insights to the scriptures. They were signing up to do what Jesus did. And to be with him where he went. To learn how to live life in step with the Spirit and in, in communion with God the Father the way Jesus did. And Paul's carrying that forward, doing the same thing. When he says, Timothy, come with me, like, his, uh, like in other letters, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And we'll learn how to do this together and I'll show you what I know. So a disciple is... Even though there are certain steps that have to be taken, at a relational level, a disciple is a person who has a relationship with another person, and they're learning from that person through instruction and imitation. So tell me things I don't know, but show me how to live it out. That's good. And it it requires both. Sometimes we can split it. We can just say, well, just do what I do. Well, I, I grew up with a dad that did that, and I didn't know why he did half the stuff that he did. Uh, we would run cattle, and uh, we'd be on horseback, and I remember me and my brother, and my, my dad would just be yelling at us, no, don't go over there, cut him off over here. I wish I knew why, but I didn't know why he was yelling, and obviously he was frustrated because we weren't doing it right. Um, so it took a while for us to get to the point where he could tell us preemptively, hey, when the cows come this way, I want you to go that way. And if they do this, I want you to do that. It's, it, there's some bumps in the road in the process. But we eventually got there. Um, so sometimes it's just do what I do. 
And sometimes we separate it and we say, let me just uh, give you the information. And then you go figure out how to do it. Discipleship at its heart is both. That's good. And that will only happen in the context of a relationship. Real people, really walking with Jesus, with all the barnacles and bumps and bruises included. Uh, it happens in real life. And that's what Timothy experienced. And I'm convinced that's what Timothy was offering as he was leading that church. So, that was the first question. What is a disciple? It's a person and it's a relationship with another person that is giving instruction and offering imitation. And I guess I should, I didn't do this quite right. For the purpose of knowing Jesus in a deep, personal, transformative way. Yes. So, so a biblical disciple includes Jesus. A, a general disciple is instruction and imitation. But we want to be biblical disciples, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So that's the first question. Second question. Uh, what is discipleship? So very much in the same vein, um, discipleship is just the process. If, uh, if it requires a relationship, discipleship means what happens over a course of time <coughs> that shapes that person into a faithful follower of Jesus. Um, so this is not my quote. I borrowed it. Um, I can give you the reference later, but I think this kind of encapsulates it. Discipleship is the process of being conformed to the likeness of Jesus for the sake of others. Again, Paul didn't meet Timothy and take him through a six-week course and give him a stamp of approval and said, great, you're in, here's a church. It's not that simple, and it doesn't happen that quick. Um, it takes time, it takes work, it takes effort. Yes. And God is involved in all of those steps. And he works through people to accomplish that. And the goal is not that just people would grow and mature, but into the likeness of Jesus. Somebody who's filled with the fruits of the Spirit. You'll get to that in 1 Timothy 3, where he talks about the, the character needed to be uh, an elder and a leader in a church, as Paul's writing to him. But somebody who is growing in likeness with love, and joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. That takes time, and, and it means putting yourself in positions that are uncomfortable so that God can squeeze out some of the old junk and work in by His Spirit the new life that He offers through Christ. That's good. Um, so over time, we start to look and act more like Jesus. And not in the sense that we will be like Jesus, but we'll have the character of Jesus because He's put His life into us by His Spirit. And then the end goal would be not just that I love God, but that I would love my neighbor. And that I live more and more, not just for myself, but I live in a way that I want and I'm concerned that I want to see God be glorified and I want to see goodness come to my neighbor. So for the sake of others. So over the course of life, it's less and less about me and more and more about God and others. That's good. So that's, that's the process. And again, the reason I showed you that map and talked about they traveled a long way for a long time, over 15 years, is that for each of us, this process will take us the rest of our life. Because we never stop following Jesus. Amen. And there's always more to learn. And there's always more things for God to refine in us. So when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus, that will never stop. But he will work people into our lives that maybe it's a semester at a college. Maybe it's a couple years. Maybe it's 15 years of working with somebody. Um, we, get, we work at the same job, and they walk with Jesus, and I need to learn how to put my feet to my faith. So God will use people to disciple us, but we will always be disciples of Jesus first. And maybe we'll or a disciple of Paul or someone else along the line. For me, it was my story. I met him when I was a sophomore in college. I had two and a half years as a student, and then I had five years uh, with him being my director and my boss at a college ministry. So I, I really had the privilege and the honor of living side by side and learning from Mike for seven years. Um, and I, I'm learning more and more that that's a rarity, um, that you can find somebody that you respect and that you trust and that you're willing to learn from for that duration of time. So even 
even if it's not one person for a long time, God will use the church to disciple people. So maybe you get a person for six months or a year. I have two little boys. Um, Milo's three, Jasper is almost two, will be two in November. My wife has all these countdowns. I think she says we have 15 more summers until they graduate and leave our house. <laughs> <laughs> She's very aware of the time that we have. Um, but I'm thankful for that because I'm learning that there will come a time when my investment in them won't end, but it will change. And I am depending on God to provide somebody else at that season of their life that will step in and say, follow me as I follow Christ. Good. The way Mike did for me at that point. Because I had, I have a great mom and a great grandma and a good dad and a, and a healthy church back home. And they paved the way for me. But I just wasn't interested for a long time. And then by the time I got interested, it, it, I had to leave and go to college. <laughs> um, but their investments and their faithfulness um, mattered. It wasn't for nothing. They did their part. And then God put my story in my life for that season of my life. And he did his part. Then I moved up here and took this job at Campus Ventures. And I learned under Dave Hughes as my director for several years. And we're still friends. And he still has investment in my life. And Dave has done his part. So it's not on any one of us to take one person from conversion to the deathbed. But we all have a part to play in making disciples. Amen. And Timothy did that. He saw it, and he did it, and I'm confident that because we're here and we don't live in Ephesus, that his church did that too somewhere, and it rippled down over time to where we're here in Sundance, Wyoming, talking about it. Because people were faithful to do their part. So, um, I can't remember if I have another one after this or not. That might be the last one. So, um, that's what I wanted to share. Because I'm a big picture guy. I, I appreciate and I love going verse by verse through a Bible. But sometimes I have to take a breath and step back and get a better read on the story and the history of what God did. And then I can step back into a letter or a book and say, okay, this is why these details matter. And these are the people that carried them out and that were faithful to do it. And this is how God worked through their lives to bring glory to himself and good to a lot of others. And so that's, that's my encouragement to you. Um, if you've had somebody in your life that's invested in you, praise God. Uh, if you haven't, ask God to do that for you. That he would provide somebody to help show you what's my next step. And if you have, that you would pray, God, show me who I can serve. And that maybe I can bring somebody under my, I, I can help guide them, a, a Timothy. It's good. Yes, sir. You know, Shane, I think Timothy is... Maybe, uh, well, I think he's telling you maybe you need to spend 7 to 15 years here. <laughs> maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe so. You can't, you can't go 32 miles. <laughs> <laughs> but to that end, one of the other things that we try to really impart on students is the benefit and the need for these different types of relationships in your life. Do you have a Paul? You have somebody that's at least a step ahead of you that you respect enough to say, I need some help. Would you show me how to walk this walk? It's good. We also say we need a Barnabas. Because when Paul started, it wasn't just Paul. He had Barnabas, the son of encouragement. We need somebody shoulder to shoulder saying, hey, let's do this together. And let's pray for this. Let's serve this way. Let's, let's do it. Amen. And then along the way, we also pray, God, would you give me Timothy? And maybe that's somebody that doesn't even know or trust Jesus yet. So maybe they start out and we say, I'm just going to serve them and love them and pray for them, share the good news where I can, and by God's grace, they come to faith. Okay, now let me help establish them and <coughs> so that they can walk with Jesus for a lifetime, even if I don't see it. So are we praying for Paul? Are we praying for Barnabas? And are we praying for Timothy? Um, if you haven't seen it yet, that's okay. You keep praying for it. And you stay faithful where you are. So, God provides it. so that's my encouragement to you, my prayer for you, and uh, grateful for the chance to come and to share that with you. So it's okay. I'd like to pray for us.
And then I don't know what comes next. What's after this? Uh, closing song. Okay. Well, let me pray for us. Uh, Father God, we say thank you um, for your faithfulness, for your perseverance, um, and for the goodness that you have so freely offered us through your son. And that he just didn't come and show up and do everything for us, but he invited the disciples into a life and a relationship um, so that he could train them and show them what it looks like for, uh, for everyday people to walk in step with the Father and with the Spirit. And we're thank you, thankful for their faithfulness and for all the people in between um, that you brought us here at this place. And it took a lot of people and a lot of work and a lot of time to get there. And so we pray that you would help us do the same, that we would be faithful men and women um, to do what you say, to obey all the things that you've commanded, um, to walk in the power of your spirit. We want to be faithful at a personal level to do that, but we also pray that you would give us eyes to see those around us so that we would be able to give that away, uh, to live for the sake of others, to serve them, uh, to love them, to bear one another's burdens. Uh, we pray that you would give us and see people come to faith so we can root them and establish them so they would grow uh, in relationship with you and enjoy an abundant life that you have to offer. So thank you for this church uh, and their faithfulness here in Sundance. And I pray that you continue to bless them. In the name of Jesus, amen.